Hi guys, Paul here <clears throat> and today I am out making a video for the first time in a long time um, about a topic that came to mind just while I was sat around the campfire admiring some of these. Now today's video is going to be about the transportation of fire using different funguses. Um, we're going to look at horseshoe fungus today or horse hoof fungus, um, Fomus fomentarius for the Latin amongst us. And uh, quite often you'll see people refer to it as being able to carry a fire, to be able to transport fire and to be able to make it last for several hours. Um, but not very often do you see people actually carry out the practice. Now I've done it myself a few times, not very often I have to admit, but a few times. Uh, and I thought today I'd just make a video covering that to give you some insight as to what it is you actually have to do to make these make your fire transportable. Now obviously fire being transportable is hugely important when it comes to primitive living. We're lucky today in that we've got the modern materials to be able to make fire very easily um, but if you were to spark up a fire using a bow drill or a hand drill or even some iron priorities then you want to be able to keep that fire for as long as possible. You do not want to have to expend that energy again to try and take your fire elsewhere. If you can make it last just from one fire, then that's what you're going to do. So as I say, I have some funguses here, some bracket fungus. I also have a few other examples. Um, there is more than just Fomus fomentarius that you can use to transport fire, but we'll get into those in a minute. First of all, let me take you in closer and we'll have a better look at what Fomus fomentarius or horseshoe fungus actually is. Okay guys, so here we have some examples of Fomus fomentaris or the horseshoe fungus or horseshoe fungus as some people call it. And um, as you can see, very grey in colour and it's a bracket fungus. So it grows on a birch tree. Now we'll have a look at where you actually find these in a minute, but just talking about the appearance. They grow on birch trees and they're a bracket fungus. So as you can see, this is where the tree trunk would have gone basically up here so this sits on the tree like that and grows out very very hard outer surface i can't remember the exact name for this stuff maybe one of you guys in the comments will be able to inform us all um, but this stuff's got a particular name it's one of the hardest substances i think you can find out in the woods um, very very brutal on knives knives will go through it so will axes but they will dull because of how hard this is now this is just the outer protective layer and this expands as the fungus is growing. Speaking of the fungus growing, underneath here we have some spore tubes. Um, as you can see on this example it's quite rotten, um, it's going mouldy even and you can see where insects have gone in. Insects will eat into these and then um, leave eggs and larvae in there um, as a food source for them. But these are the spore tubes on the bottom here. You can see on this example, this would be a fresher example. This is dried out, this is still dead, but this is an example that's been kept more carefully. And you can see there's no insect holes, and this is more reminiscent of how you would find a sort of un, undamaged, unrotten fungus. Again, you can see where it's attached to the tree. Um, and also in here, we have a material known as amadou. Hopefully you can see this here. Amadou is used in primitive fire lighting using iron parites. It can also be used as insurance. I have done a video on insurance in the past using Amadou. Um, essentially this is the trauma layer. This is where the mushroom is still growing. It grows up and out and uh, this top layer here is always expanding. Very, very, very fine fibres in here. Almost like cotton wool. And with a bit of processing they'll take even a dull spark. Now this helps the fungus smolder. Because it's so fine, it will smolder for a long time when you get this going. The spore tubes will smolder as well, but the amadou here tends to be the best. Now, in a big example like this, the amadou tends to be quite thin. You can see it on the edges here, very, very thin. There's always more of it up the top here where the, where the fungus is growing. Um, 
but it tends to be very thin along these sides. So if you're wanting to harvest um, one of these funguses for amadou, then you want to look for small specimens because they'll have more of a an amadou layer in them. They're smaller, they're slow growing, uh, they're growing quicker, so you get more amadou in them. So that's how it looks. Um, now it's okay knowing how they look, but you've got to know where to find them. So next, we're going to take a look at where these grow, um, what to look out for when you're harvesting them, some alternatives, and the kind of trees they grow on. So let's go and have a look. Okay guys, so here we are looking at a birch tree. Now, <coughs> birch trees are where you will find this fungus growing. This is a living example. And as you can see, it's growing amongst some pine here. Uh, there's also some willow along this um, line over here. Uh, so it tends to grow kind of around those trees. Pine, spruce, willow, um, larch, anything like that. And you'll usually find it in amongst those. Um, now, birch is a very, very easy tree to identify thanks to the bark on it. As you can see, it is very kind of distinctive in comparison with what's around here. The obvious way to identify it, looking at the bark, is to find a nice clean piece like this, and you can see the lenticles going across the bark. They go across the way, they do not run up and down, they will always go across. You can see an old one here, where they're more pronounced, again going across. Very white tree, the bark will peel as the tree grows, and that's just what I've used for my um, fire lighting there a moment ago. It's just some of this bark peeled off. Very, very high in oils, um, so it makes for a very, very good tinder. As you can see, it's quite distinctive. Okay, so these are the sorts of trees you're going to find the fungus growing on. And um, there are a few examples around here that I'll be able to show you and uh, should give you an idea of what it is you're looking for. Okay folks, so here we can see again a birch tree, which we can identify by the white bark and the grain going across it. Now, as you may be able to tell, this tree is very dead. Now, horsefoot fungus, or Fomus fomentarius, will only grow on dead birch trees. I've yet to see any on a living tree. You might find um, that the tree can be very, very close to death and they'll start forming on it, but usually they tend to be trees like this, where the tree is very rotten and um, that gives the mushrooms, the material they need to grow. So as you can see, this is just one little stump and it's absolutely peppered in the fungus. These smaller ones here, the ones I was talking about having more amadou, this is what you would be looking for. These bigger ones here would be more in line with what you're looking for for transporting fire. The bigger the fungus, the more burn time you're going to get out of it. The smaller, the more amadou you're going to get out of it. Now, as you can see, some of these examples are actually rotten. You can tell that quite often by looking at the underside. Apologies, it's quite dark there. Um, the underside is kind of rotten. You can tell it's soft. I mean, you shouldn't be able to do this. If you can do that, then it's no use. This, on the other hand, would be a much more fresh example um, I can feel the underside, it's nice and smooth, I don't know if you can see it, nice and smooth there, very very hard, very firmly attached to the tree. Now these attach themselves to the tree as they're growing and they come off fairly easily. The way I like to take mine off, you'll see people kind of um, hitting them with their hand down the way, or bashing them up the way. If you're going to bash it, bash it up the way. 
I tend to find that works best because it tapers up like this. So your weakest point is here, and if you're hitting it here, then it's more likely to fold over and come off. Um, but I find the easiest way, because they grow with these little lips on the outside edges, you can get your hand in there and you can just pull them off. Just like that. Okay, so you can see there, still nice living. Now this one has actually grown into one before it. So this, this one here in the middle would have been growing beforehand. And then this one has grown and absorbed this one as well as grown through a stick. So this is quite a, an unusual example, but it is an example nonetheless. Um, not very often you see that. But again, this will still work. Now, I'm not going to waste this. I am going to take it back. And I would suggest to other people, only take these if you're going to use them. I've always got a supply of them. I always use them on courses for either decorations or actually teaching. Um, so this will not go to waste. Now let's go back to camp, check on the fire, and um, talk about how we get the process started. Okay folks, so we've had a look at where we can find these, what kind of trees we'll find them on, what condition it is we're looking to find them in. Now the next important thing, once you've broken it off, is to leave it somewhere to dry. You want it to be as dry as possible because that's going to make for a much easier life when you're trying to get this lit for carrying your fire. So step one, get it dry. Um, have a space inside your shelter, have a space by the fire just for drying it out. I tend to put it so the back is facing, that way moisture can escape out of here because this is a very, very sealed unit. So have this side facing the fire so the heat's getting in and driving the water out. When it's dry, you'll know. Um, have a feel of it. You can feel the spore tubes are all very dry and um, it just doesn't have any moisture in it whatsoever. So now that we've done that, the next step is to processing it, process it for using. Now I could use it like this and it would work perfectly fine. You can see I've used it before. Um, but what I've got here is punk wood still attached to the back where it was growing to the tree. Punk wood is just rotten wood, and obviously where this fungus was growing onto the tree, it's just pulled some of that wood away with it. Now this isn't going to smoulder as well as the fungus is. So what I like to do is get rid of that, and that just gives me a nice clean surface, all fungus, um, and I feel more confident that it's going to smoulder properly that way. Now, there's a few different ways you could remove this. You can remove it with a knife, but again, these funguses are very, very hard and um, you don't want to cut yourself. So you can take it off with a knife if you're careful. Um, kind of slow and steady. Or what I like to do is use an axe. Now what I've got here is a little hatchet. And uh, this just makes life much easier when you're trying to take the back off. Again... None of this is necessary, you could use this as is, but for getting the best performance out of it, I've always found that this works the best. So what I do is always work to the front of your block so that your axe can't come through and hit you. Hold it on this side and just use your axe. To carve away that punk wood. You'll know when you're through because you'll start see, see seeing more of the spore tubes and more amadou exposed. Being very careful and just taking it nice and slow. Okay. Okay, so I'm happy with that. I can see I've exposed more amadou up here, and I can see I've cut off that punk wood at the back here. What this is, is basically amadou that was forming. So this is the growth of the mushroom here. This would have been the new growth. Um, so we can keep that in, that's not a problem. 
and again just makes it nice and smooth easier to work with Okay, so now we've finished with the axe, we don't need that anymore. Okay, so now that we're happy with that, what I like to do now is just take off some of this hard surface on the front. Now you've got to be very careful taking this off because it can cause deflections with your axe. Um, again, this isn't a necessary step, it's just something I like to do and uh, we'll get into why I like to do it in a minute. Um, but again, using your axe, going very very carefully, just try and take off the outer layer here. And um, again, very hard, so just keep an eye on your tools, make sure they're up to the task. Um, it's not worth ruining a knife over because it's not essential. You'll see why I'm doing this in just a second. Okay, now you can see I thinned it down a bit here. I've taken the hard layer off, I'm through to the spore tubes on this side. Now what I'm going to do, and the reason I've done that, is use this stick here to make a hole in the fungus so that I can put a string through here and I can carry it easily. I want to be able to carry this away from my person because these smolder very hot and um, having it on a string or a stick allows it to kind of swing in the air and that oxygen keeps the whole thing going. Where I am in Scotland, it's very damp, so having that airflow just helps ensure that it's going to stay burning. Um, if you were to just leave it sitting like this, it would smoulder, um, but there is a chance that it's not going to get enough air and the moisture in the air is actually going to put it out. So what I like to do is just put a hole in it so I can put a string through it and then I can carry it, swinging it and forcing air into it. So <clears throat> the way I'm going to do that is use my knife. You can see I've got a nice strong stick here. What I'm going to do is just put a point on it. Doesn't have to be anything fancy. Just sharp. sure it tapers kind of gradually you don't want it to be very thick and then very thin and you want it to be about the width or as long as the uh, slice of amity you're trying to get through or the slice of fungus you're trying to get through so that should be okay now where I've gone through this hard layer here I can use my stick now and poke a hole into the fungus like this Okay, you can see I've made a hole there. I can come in at it from this side now and do the same thing. I can see I've broken my tip there, so I'm just going to sharpen that again, just to make sure that it goes through cleanly. So try and line up with your hole, and then there we go. Okay, so I'm happy I can get some string in there and uh, that will allow us to just carry it more easily and force air into it. The next step is igniting this. Okay so as you can see the fire is just smouldering away and you've got to bear in mind what we're trying to do here is transport this fire so basically I'm going to let this fire die out and then what I want to do is relight it using this. Now, to do that, we're going to have to ignite this fungus. And the way we're going to do that is just by clearing 
some space in amongst the embers for the horseshoe fungus to sit um, so that it catches light. A wee bit of flame is good, it will help encourage it ignite. Um, and what I'm going to do is just sit this exposed corner in here and wait for it to start burning. Again, a little bit of flame is good, so feel free to just put a little bit of fuel on there as well. And that will help speed up the, uh, the process. Now, the longer you leave this sitting on the fire for, the more likely you are to end up with a successful burning fungus. The last thing you want to do is start setting fire to this pull it out, let your fire go out, and then realise that actually your fungus isn't burning as well as it should be to enable you to transport your fire. So just leave it for longer than you think you would need to. I'm going to do this in real time here, so I'm not going to cut the video, and um, you'll see just how long it takes here. Again, I'm just adding little bits of fuel just to promote flames, <coughs> which will help speed up the process of getting that fungus lit. Also, you can blow into the fire. It helps direct the heat to the fungus, as well as increasing the heat of the fire. Again, increasing the likelihood that this is gonna catch. So I'm gonna do that now. Okay, so I'm quite happy with that. What I'm going to do now is pull it out and have a look and just see what it's doing. So you can see there, it is smouldering away. And that's exactly what we want. I've still got my hole intact here for putting the, the cord through and we have begun smouldering on this side. But what I'm going to do is just put it in for a wee bit longer, again, just to be sure, because when this fire goes out, I do not want to have, have to go through the process of doing another hand drill or doing another bow drill to secure fire. So it's better to be safe than sorry when it comes to this. So I'm just going to pop it back on there for another couple of minutes. Again, just ensuring it's got plenty of fuel to get it going. Now, what I'm going to do is just use a bit of man-made cord to put in that hole um, for the sake of time and ease. What you could do is use pine roots and they would work perfectly well. Um, but for me personally, a bit of jute that I just have lying around, which is natural fibre anyway, should do the trick. So I'm going to pull it out again now and just see how it's looking. You don't want to let it get too hot otherwise you're going to lose the ability to handle it. So I'm happy with that. <coughs> you can see it's smouldering very very nicely. And with oxygen, you know, that just encourages the uh, the ember to spread. So what I'm going to do is just string um, my jute through here. It's out of the way of the ember. And now what I have is fungus on a string, essentially. Now this is my fire ready to be transported. Okay, so you can see here, I've got my fungus on my string and smouldering away nicely. You can see the smoke coming off that. And um, let me show you why I feel it's necessary to add the string or to have a stick. Now there's actually a bit of a technique to when you're walking with one of these. So as not to put it into your side and burn yourself because these do burn very hot. And what you want to do is just kind of walk 
but like in an exaggerated manner so that you're just encouraging oxygen into this. Now you don't want to swing it really hard in case it comes off and start setting fire to the ground around you. You just want to kind of gently swing it. Going from about 45 degree to 45 degree behind you. And that's just enough to force a wee bit of air. And you can see as it's coming forward here, it lights up because of the air that's getting into it. Again, I'll bring it a bit closer here. Again, you can see as it lights up when I'm bringing it towards me. <clears throat> so now I've got my fire. What do I want to do with it? Well, I've got a number of options. I can use this now for transporting my fire um, to anywhere in these woods, to you know wherever it is I need to be. Um, if I'm going somewhere and I just want to have a, a fire for cooking food very quickly, or if I'm going to a different camp, or if I just want to save the fire I have here already, then I can use this. So I can carry this with me Or what I can do is just set it on a branch like this. I can leave that there somewhere where the wind is flowing to it. You can see there's a strong breeze hitting it here and the smoke's being blown backwards away from it. I can leave that now, go and do other things, go and hunt, go and fish, go and forage, come back. My main fire will have burnt out, whereas this will smolder for several hours. A big one will go for seven, maybe even eight hours. Now, it has to be kept in kind of optimum conditions for that to happen. I would expect, usually, you're gonna get maybe three or four hours out of it. But they have been known to go up to seven. And just leaving it here like this is all you would need to do. You could go away now, do whatever it is you want to do, come back and light your fire. Now, it's important to note that you're not going to be able to light a fire using just this. What you're going to need is something that's going to take that heat and make it into flame. Now much like we do with bow drill or hand drill or even iron parietes where we create an ember instead of a flame, what we need to do with that ember is then blow it into flame using some sort of fine fibrous material. Now for most of us that's usually grass and that's what I'm going to use today. I've collected some dry grass just on my way to camp and I'm going to use that to, um, to catch the embers basically that are on this um, and then use that to light a fire. So I've got my, uh, my fungus here. I'm gonna go for a walk just to let it burn for a while, just to show you guys that it does smolder and it will carry on smoldering for quite some time. And then once I feel we're kind of having proved concept, I will then light the fire with it. Okay folks, so here we are. It's been smouldering for a good hour and a half anyway, um, if not more. I actually bumped into someone and we ended up having a conversation um, and it's been smouldering all that time. As you can see the fire has gone out um, behind us there. 
but this is still smouldering away perfectly fine. Now, you'll remember I said at the beginning of the video there was a few different funguses we could use for this. This one, um, horse hoof fungus or Fomus fomentarius, um, is kind of the best one for long term um, fire kind of transport because it's going to last for a good three or four hours five even seven hours at the upper end with a big specimen however we do have alternatives and i do have a couple of them here to show you um, one is the cramp ball uh, daldina concentrica or something along those lines in latin um, and again very very small grows primarily on ash trees um, which we don't have around here so this isn't really an option for me um, to use regularly and as you can see it's much much smaller so it burns for far far shorter amount of time <clears throat> and what that generally means is you need to kind of collect and it's it's fortunate that these grow in groups because you need to collect maybe 10 or 20 of these and be constantly kind of exchanging the ember now what i mean by exchanging the ember is taking the ember from this our horse hoof and using that ember to light another bit of fungus. So I could do this um, once over with another horse hoof fungus and I could extend how long I have that way or I could use something like this. Now you can use these to put into your grass to blow into flame. They're smaller and more manageable but it's not really necessary. Um, and the way you do that It's just to blow on your fungus. Find out where the hot spots are and then put the fungus you're wanting to ignite where that hot spot is and then blow. So you can see there, this is now burning and I could use that. The other option I have available to me in this part of the world particularly um, tends to be much further north that you find this. Now this is what's known as chaga. It grows again kind of exclusively on birch trees has a very kind of burnt broken up appearance but we'll go into a finding and identifying this in another video but it carries the same property. You can ignite it using another fungus and this again will hold an ember for a very long time. This in my opinion is on par with the horse hoof but it's rarer so it's not um, something you're going to come into contact with very often and especially not large specimens but because it's very dense it will burn for a long time and again the igniting process is exactly the same and there you go you can see that's lit now and that will smolder as well. But to go back to, to the, the focus of today's video, <coughs> let's get round to actually using this to light some dry grass. You can see the fire in the background there has completely gone out and uh, this is now my only option for getting a fire going. So I'm going to go over to the fireplace now, you can see I have some dry grass, it's just dry grass, nothing else. And what I'm going to do is hold the grass against the fungus, again where it's burning, where it's white hot. I'm going to hold the grass against there and I'm going to blow on it. Now I'm going to be very careful of my hands here because this is basically one big giant ember and it's very easy to burn yourself. Um, I've still got a nice clean end here where I put my rope through. So I can use that to my advantage. So I don't really have to hold the whole thing. I can use the rope to hold the fungus. But the grass is going to go against it and I'm going to blow it into flame. Let's see if we can get this to really work. Okay, so I'm at my fireplace, as you can see, totally dead here, nothing of any use to me whatsoever. 
So this is the only means I have for lighting my fire now. I'm going to just ruffle up the grass a wee bit. What that does is make the fibres finer and uh, more likely to catch. I'm going to open it up a wee bit and make it into what essentially replicates a bird's nest. Just break it up. Now usually you could spend kind of a lot of time doing this but because we've got such a big ember it's not really essential. Um, the ember is very hot so we don't really need to go to all the effort we would normally go to when we were blowing an ember to flame because this ember is significantly bigger. So there we have it. Just some dry grass and here is my fungus. And there we have it, fire from our fungus. Now obviously if I was wanting to maintain this fire I would start putting my kindling on and then moving up through the stages of my firewood. Um, but as it is, this is just for demonstration purposes so I'm just going to let this die out again. But as you can see, we still have a significant amount of ember left. <coughs> and um, that should be more than enough to uh, kind of try again, should your grass be too wet or should you need to um, transport your fire again somewhere else. So now that we've done that, let's sit down and just have a quick chat about what it is we've done today and um, some tricks and tips and also um, kind of what you can expect in future videos. <coughs> okay everyone, so that's going to do it for today's video. <coughs> we'll quickly just go over what we've done there. I know it's been a long video but there's kind of a lot to cover and it's a very sort of unused skill, something you don't see people doing very often. So I just wanted to do a really in-depth video on it. So we've gone out and we've identified a horseshoe fungus, Fomus fomentarius. We've identified the tree that it came on, which was birch, and what that tree looks like and how to identify it, and the state of that tree, what we're looking to find that tree like, to be able to best have the chances of finding one of these. Um, We've then harvested one of those. We've talked about what it is you need to do to prep one of these, um, which as we've seen, isn't very much. Just dry it out, take off the punk wood, and you're good to go. We've then walked around. Um, we've talked about how having a string on this makes it significantly easier to use. I've then walked around and just let this burn for probably about two hours now. Um, I asked, actually bumped into someone, forgot speaking, ended up having a whole conversation. Um, so I spent a lot more time letting this burn away than I intended to, and yet you can see it handled it perfectly fine. We then talked about some of the other funguses that can be used. Again, those are chaga, cramp balls, or King Alfred's cakes. Um, and another one I didn't have to hand that you can use is birch polypore. Again, exclusive on birch. It's kind of a brown tan color when it's growing and it can be used for transporting fire as well. But again, it's not going to be as good as the Fomus fomentarius or horseshoe fungus is. We've then just blown it into flame. As you can see, it's still smoking behind me. As I said, I'm not going to build it up because I'm just about to head home. Um, but you can see how quickly you can blow dry glass, dry grass into flame and um, build your fire up again. The fire was completely out beforehand, so you can see that it was just all the all the Fomus fomentarius doing its thing there. 
I hope this video has been enjoyable for you. I know it's been a long one. Um, like I say, it's kind of an, an interesting topic, not something you see very often, but you hear quite a lot about. So hopefully this video is kind of put into context the process. Um, if you have any questions or any ideas or maybe any suggestions on what I can improve personally in my technique, please feel free to comment below and leave them um, there and I'll get back to you on those. Um, as for videos, obviously I'm back at my camp now in Scotland, so I'm going to be trying to upload more videos more often. Um, we'll see how that goes. I'm not going to promise, you know, one a week or anything like that. I'm just going to try and do them as I feel kind of inspired to do them, much like I did today. So that's going to be it, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you found it really useful. Um, such an amazing skill, such an amazing resource, and uh, to be able to use it efficiently and effectively is a really, really good string to have on your bow. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you all again soon.